probability. Before we get into actual probability and how to calculate, we need to talk about a couple different terms. So some definitions. So when we calculate probabilities, a trial. Now, when we talked last week, we did simulations. We talked about in the simulation, we have components, which is a repeated event. And then we put those components together to create trials. And then we use those trials to measure a response variable and then use that response variable to answer our original question. With probability models, a trial is defined as something a little bit different. So a trial here is kind of like our component with the simulation. It is one observance of a random phenomenon. And we call the result of that trial an outcome. <clears throat> so if I was flipping a coin, one flip of the coin could constitute a trial. I flipped it. It would be something that I'd be doing over and over and over again if I was wanting to. So I flip it, that's the trial. One flip. The outcome would be however it lands. Did it land heads or did it land tails? So that's the actual value that that particular trial takes on. My trial might consist of multiple flips. Maybe I want to flip 10 times and see if I get 50% heads. So 10 flips would constitute one trial. The results at each step would be the outcomes. So the first flip came heads, next flip came heads, next flip came tails, and so on. Each of those recordings is a, an outcome of my trial, which was flipping the coin. Or rolling the dice. If I roll a pair of dice, rolling them once would be a trial, whatever they actually come up. So a sum of six. That's my outcome. Okay. So a couple words there. <coughs> An event. So an event is a collection of outcomes that satisfy a given condition. So an event is a set of outcomes that would satisfy some given condition. So let's say I was rolling two dice, and I wanted the event of rolling a four. So when I roll the two dice, the sum is equal to four. So what outcomes, when rolling two dice, would give me a sum of four? Two and two, three and one, and one and three, right? Order would matter when we're rolling dice. So we have two and two, one and three, three and one. Those three outcomes come together to form the event rolling the sum of four. Does that make sense? So one of the things you're going to be expected to do is, given a scenario, define certain events. What they mean by that is list out all the possible outcomes that satisfy a given condition. So what's the collection of every outcome that would work for the condition we applied? So in our case, our condition was rolling a four. Our event were the three outcomes that satisfy that condition. One, three, three, one, two, two. Okay. Now, an event is a subset of a sample space. A sample space is a collection of all possible outcomes for some random event. So we kind of built this up again, a trial is a repeated random phenomenon. So doing something over and over again. The outcome is the result of each of those trials. We can take those outcomes and group them into events. So uh, outcomes that satisfy a given condition. And if I take a look at every possible outcome, we would get our sample space. So the sample space is always going to be one of the most important things we can identify as far as probability goes. We need to know how many different ways something can actually occur. Or what are the possible values that my random event can take on. Okay, so some examples. 
if I was looking at a score on a test and I wanted to know the sample space of all possible scores. So think about when you take a test, what are your possible scores on that test? Zero to 100, you can get a zero percent, you missed everything, to 100 percent, you got everything right, okay? So in notation, and notation is going to be extremely important, you need to make sure when you write sample spaces, when you write events, you have correct notation here. Sample space is denoted with a capital S. And they're always written in set notation, which means you're going to use little curly braces to close off all of your possible values. As far as drawing those go, as long as you're fairly close, I'm not going to dock you for your artistic ability on that. Okay. So the sample space in this case would be anything from 0 to 100%. One of the things you also want to make sure you do when you define your sample space is give any units of measure if it's applicable to the scenario. So in this case, when we say 0 to 100, we need to say what 0 to 100 means. What do we mean when I give you a value from that sample space? And in this case, it's a percentage. There might be times where there are no units. If I was rolling a die, there's no units when you get a number that pops up, right? So there would be no units to report there. But if there are units with your scenario, you need to make sure you report that with your sample space. Everyone okay with that? Okay. So sample space, 0 to 100%. Now, this dash, when I write my sample space in this manner, 0 to 100%, this dash means anything between 0 and 100%. So any possible value you can think of between 0 and 100 would satisfy or fall within this particular sample space. So that might be 20%. That might be 35%. That might be 20.6%. That might be 95.78453%. Make sense? So anything from 0 to 100 would be satisfactory for this particular sample space. Now, an event. While we're talking sample space, let's also talk about events, how to define those and write those out. If they ask for the event that you pass the test, Okay, on a traditional test, if I was looking at passing, what score would I have to achieve? Usually a 60 or higher, right? So passing, if I'm looking at that event, okay, and I want to define that event, events are denoted with a capital E. So capital S represents sample space. That's saying that's everything that we can possibly have happen. An event is denoted with a capital E. That's just saying these are the possible outcomes that satisfy a given condition. So in this case, our condition is passing. So if I was going to write this out in set notation, my event of passing would be 60 to 100%. Okay, so when you write out events, you're going to use a capital E, you're still going to use set notation, but now you're only going to include outcomes that satisfy whatever particular condition you happen to be concerned with. Am I okay with that idea? Okay. Let's take a look at another example. I want the sample space for rolling a single die. So if I want the sample space for rolling a single die, what's that going to look like? What are my options? One through six. So if I'm looking at my sample space now, and this is a, a regular 
six-sided die. Okay, now if they change that up, anytime they say a die or rolling dice, always assume it's six-sided. The only time that'll change, they'll have to actually define a new type of die. So some are four-sided or 12-sided, 10-sided, things like that. But they'll tell you specifically in the problem if they're changing that up. So anytime a die is used, assume it's six sides unless they tell you differently. Okay? So if I'm rolling a die, I heard that the sample space should be one through six. What do you guys think here? Okay. Now think about my, my notation here. We've got the capital S, we have the set notation. Now when I said 0 to 100%, what did that mean? What did that define? Any possible score between 0 and 100%. Any possible number between 0 and 100, right? So like 27.6 would be within that set. Now if I write that this way for rolling a die, 1 through 6 means I could possibly run a or roll a 1.5 or a 3.76, right? Which we know can't happen. So when you denote your sample spaces, one of the things you have to keep in mind, there are two different types of sample spaces. This top one is called a continuous sample space. It means that within the boundaries from 0 to 100, everything works in between. Okay, There's no limit to what numbers can possibly occur within those boundaries. Anything is fair game. But when we roll a die, there are very specific outcomes that we can actually get and not others. So rolling 1 through 6 here doesn't apply because I can't roll a 2.3, right? So in this case, we have to write it a little bit differently, and I'll tell you kind of what it's called here in a second. So in this case, we actually have to physically list out all of our possible outcomes. So when we define our sample space this time, it's going to be the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 separated by commas. So I can roll any of those numbers nothing else would make sense. I can't roll a 0 0.6, I can't roll a 5.2 or anything like that. I can only roll these six numbers. Okay, so whereas our first sample space was continuous, our second sample space here is discrete. So a discrete sample space means that it's a listed number of outcomes. You can't simply say the lower and upper bound and say everything in between. There are very specific values within those boundaries that you can get and others that you cannot. So you have to physically list what you're looking at. So in this case we have to actually have one, two, three, four, five, six listed out because no other values would satisfy this particular out or these outcomes. So you've got the continuous, which means you can just use the dash. You've got discrete, which means you have to list them out. And on a test or quiz, you need to make sure you do that. If you were to write out 0, 1, 2 up to 100, that's not correct. Because on that given test, anything between 0 and 100 works. So there you have to use the dash. So in those continuous cases, this is the way it looks. On discrete cases, you need to list them out. Okay. So make sure we understand that. So with that in mind, write out the sample space for a coin toss. So one single coin toss, what is the sample space going to look like for that particular scenario? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, with the sample space, in this case, there's only two outcomes, heads and tails. Now, as far as listing things out, if it's, if it's words that are involved, uh, it wouldn't hurt to write the entire word out so that people know for sure what you're talking about. But on something like this, where it's a very common, like a coin toss, we know H probably stands for heads, T probably stands for tails. But again, it wouldn't hurt to define those. So H is heads, T, or T is tails, so people know that. Okay. Now, one other thing with this. What if I change this up a little bit, and I say instead of a, a coin toss, one flip, I say, what's the sample space if I flip a coin three times? So if I wanted to flip a coin three times and record heads and tails, how is that going to affect my sample space? Okay. So the way we have to look at this, we have to look at it as if I am flipping three separate coins. So I have three separate quarters in front of me, I'm going to flip each one in succession. So now, when I think about my outcomes, I'm going to be recording the result of all three flips together. So I flip my first quarter, what are my options? Heads or tails. And I flip my second quarter, I have heads or tails. And I flip my third quarter, heads or tails. Now my outcomes are going to be the results of all three flips. So when I flip those three separate coins, what are the different possibilities that I could have? You could get all heads. Okay, so I could get heads, heads, heads. I could get tails, tails, tails. Whoops. I mean, that's an option too. That is an option, but. So tails, tails, tails. Now, from here, all you got to do is kind of keep track of, or the easiest thing is keep track of how many heads and tails you have. So my next option is I get two heads and a tail, right? So I either get all three of one or the other, or I could get two heads and one tail. So I got to think about what, how that could work. So I could get two heads to start with, followed by, followed by one tail. <laughs> I could get heads, tails, heads, or I could get tails first and then heads, heads. I'm okay with that? So all it is is figuring out, okay, two heads, one tail, and just move the tail to different spots. And then I can also get two tails with one head in the same manner. So I could get two tails first followed by a head. I could get a tail, then a head, then a tail. Or I could get a head followed by two tails. So some sample spaces might be a little more difficult to come up with. You just got to think through each of the possibilities and list them out accordingly. So if I were to do three flips of a coin, I actually have eight different possible outcomes for that three coin flip. Are you okay with that idea? So when you get these, a lot of times, as soon as people see coin toss, they just immediately assume sample space is heads, tails. But you got to think about what you're doing with that coin toss. If it's just one simple coin, then it is just heads, tails. But if you're doing something where you're flipping it multiple times, you got to take into account the outcomes for each of the different possibilities. Okay? So that's something to kind of be aware of on the problems you're going to see a little bit later. Okay, last one here. Give me the sample space for the number of free throws made on a two-shot try. So you shoot two free throws. What are the possible outcomes for the number of makes that you have? about what we're doing here. The number of makes. 
Your sample space should be a series of numbers. How many makes did you have in their two-shot trial? So, here's what your sample space should look like in this case. Here's another thing you've got to be careful with. You've got to think about what the response variable is. What are we actually trying to measure? In this case, we want to know, when we shoot two free throws, how many makes can occur? How many free throws can we make in that two-shot attempt? So, I might miss them both which means I made zero, or I might make one, or I might make them both, okay? So the sample space in this case is either I make zero, I make one, or I make two. Now, what I saw a lot of you doing was a sample space like this. So make, make. Make, miss, miss, make, or miss, miss. Okay. Now, if this was my sample space, my scenario would have been to record the outcome of a two-shot try. So if I was recording what I did, whether I made or missed, I would be looking at each individual shot and putting them together. So my first two shot attempt, I can either make, make, so make them both. I could make and then miss. I could miss the first, make the second, or I could miss both. So this one would have been if we wanted to record the outcomes of a two shot try. So one of the things you have to be careful with when defining your sample space is to pay close attention to what you're actually measuring. In our example, we wanted the number of makes, which means our sample space has to be a set of numbers. If we're recording how we made or miss, then you're going through the whole process of make, 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 miss, miss, make, and so on. Okay? So one of the things that's important is that you guys understand, based on a given scenario, what does that sample space look like? A sample space determines everything when it comes to probability. You okay with that? All right, so building a probability model. <clears throat> so a probability model consists of two major parts. First, it has a defined sample space. So we know all of the possible outcomes for our given random event. And it also needs to constitute the probability for each possible outcome. So when it asks for you to create a probability model, <clears throat> you need to be able to define the sample space, so what are all the possible outcomes, and give the probability for each of those specific outcomes. Okay. So an example, if I'm rolling two dice, So if I wanted to create a probability model for simply rolling two dice and recording the outcome. So what did I roll? Did I roll a 1, 2? Did I roll a 3, 4? A 5, 2? Whatever. Okay, I'm just recording what dots show up. So if I'm rolling two dice, how many different outcomes should I have? 36 different outcomes, right? So one of the things I'd have to be able to do is list out those different outcomes. So we've got 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 
to 1, to 2, and so on, right? So here would be our sample space, which is listed out pictorially. You could do this as an ordered pair. So in parentheses, 1, 1 represents a 1 and then a 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, and so on, okay? So here is our sample space, 36 different possible outcomes, okay? Now, if all I'm looking at is the number of dots that show up on the face, so a 1, 1, or a 1, uh, 1 5, or a 2, 3, or whatever, what is the probability that I get any one of these particular combinations? One out of 36. One out of 36. If I roll the two dice, as long as they're fair and balanced dice, all of these should be equally likely to have occurred, right? So 1, 1 is just as likely to occur as 3, 4, which is just as likely to occur as 4, 2, or so on, right? So my probability model would be the 36 different options. So the sample space and the probability for each of these different sample spaces, or, or sorry, of these different outcomes. So there's a 1 in 36 chance of rolling 1, 1. There's a 1 in 36 chance of rolling 2, 1, and so on. Okay? Now this is a fairly large sample space, so you would be able to kind of abbreviate. In this case, you'd be able to say there's 36 different outcomes. Since the dice are fair, each outcome is equally likely, so there's a probability of 1 out of 36. Now, let's change this up a little bit. Let's roll two dice, but now we want to investigate the sum of the two faces. So we're not concerned with how many dots showed up on each individual dice. We want the sum of the two dice together. So if I roll two dice and I look at the sum, what are my possible outcomes? What is my sample space going to look like? Two, three, four, five, all the way up to 12, right? So my sample space, my outcomes, either I roll a sum of two, a sum of three, a sum of four, and so on up to 12. Now, here's one thing to note. When you want to abbreviate in your sample spaces, because in some cases you might have a list of numbers like from 1 to 100, and you're not going to sit there and list every single number from 1 to 100. Or you might have a sample space that includes 10,000 outcomes. You're not going to list all 10,000 outcomes. So if you're doing this, you can establish your pattern. So going by ones, going by twos, or threes, or whatever your scenario calls for, okay? Once you've established the pattern with the first couple numbers, so we know we're just counting from two up until I say stop, you can use the ellipses here to denote a gap. So this says the sample space is two, three, four, continue that pattern until you get to 12. So if you have a long or large sample space, you can shorten it down using those ellipses to denote a common pattern that needs to be maintained until you get to the end. Okay, so this would be acceptable as far as listing out a sample space in this manner. Now, at this point, if I want a probability model, I have the first half of it. I have my sample space. Now I also need to go through and calculate the probabilities for each of those different outcomes. So if I have 36 different outcomes, what's the probability that I roll a sum of two? One out of 36, because there's only one way to roll a two, right? So the probability that I roll a sum of two would be one out of 36. Okay, what's the probability of rolling a three? Two out of 36, because I can roll a two one or a 1, 2. There's two different possibilities for that particular outcome. So I can get a 2 out of 36. How many different ways can I roll a 4? 3. So I can get 3, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3. So three different options, which means I have a 3 out of 36 chance. And then I would continue that on, find every single probability to match with each outcome until I get to 12, which has a probability of 1 
one out of 36. Okay, so as far as the probability model goes, now I showed you the abbreviation for sample space, but if you are listing out a probability model, you cannot abbreviate because every single outcome has to be accounted for with a probability. So you would need to list out every single outcome with its given probability as well. Okay, so just keep that in mind when you're working some of the problems out on the homework later. We're okay with that idea? Okay. Now, there are three types of probability. We're just going to simply run through these real quick. Don't write these down. Okay. This is not going to be something important where I'm going to say, hey, what type of probability is being shown here? It's just something to kind of keep in mind. Empirical probabilities are found by actually physically doing some random event over and over and over again. Okay. So you're actually performing the random phenomenon, recording the outcomes, and calculating the probability based on those outcomes. So if I were to take a coin and I wanted to know what percent of the time I should expect to see heads, I might flip that coin 10,000 times. Okay? And I might go back through then after I've recorded every single outcome, all 10,000 flips, and I might find that 4,965 times heads came up. So if I wanted to calculate probability, I would take the 4,965 heads divided by the 10,000 total flips. So my empirical probability would be about 49.6% for the probability of heads coming up when you flip a coin. Does that make sense? So empirical probability is when you actually perform the event over and over and over again and then calculate percentages based on the findings. All right. The second type of probability is theoretical. This is what we're going to spend 99% of our time on. Theoretical probability. When you flip a coin, what do you know to be the actual percent of times you should see heads? What percent of the times, if I flip a coin, should I see heads? 50% of the time, right? So I know theoretically I should see a 50-50 split between heads and tails. Now empirical and theoretical don't always match up. Like in my example, I flipped the coin 10,000 times, I got 4,965 heads, my probability was 49.6% that I get heads. But I know theoretically that should have been 50%. Okay. So theoretical probability is the one we believe to be true for events that have equally likely outcomes. Okay. So anytime we know that there are equally likely outcomes to have occurred, we can use theoretical probability. If outcomes are not equally likely, the only way we can calculate probabilities is empirically. So if we were to believe that a coin was not fair, that it's weighted somehow, we don't know how it's weighted in terms of what should come up more or less and how often or how much more or less. So we'd have to, have to sit there and flip that coin over and over and over again to obtain an empirical probability. So theoretical only works if each of the outcomes in our sample space are equally likely to occur. Okay, so that's pretty important there. The last type of probability is what's called a personal probability. These are probabilities based on nothing more than personal belief. Okay. This is one when you sit there and you say, I bet that 60% of teams are eight or, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, well, like I just did earlier, theoretical probability, I said we're going to use this 99% of the time. Well, I have no evidence to back, back that up. I don't know how much of the time we'll be using theoretical versus empirical, but based on what I've noticed from before, I'm just making up a percentage that should be pretty close. Okay, so personal probability is a probability that's just made up on the spot. There's no data to back it up, there's no evidence, no theory, it's just something that you say. Okay, most of the time when you hear personal probabilities, they're going to be very unreliable, it's not going to be very close. So those are our three different types. Now, like I said, theoretical probability is what we're going to focus on. So, a couple things with that. When we talk about theoretical probability, we are building mathematical models demonstrating outcomes of events. 
So these are models we believe to be true based on outcomes of events. So the probability, you guys already know how to calculate probability. It's a ratio, so it's a fraction of desired outcomes to total outcomes. So what are the values that I do want divided by how many total values I have at my disposal? Notation is going to be a capital P and then in parentheses usually a given letter or they might actually write the word or description out. But basically when we calculate the probability of an event, so this is event A. So whatever event A constitutes, whatever condition needs to be satisfied, we're going to calculate its probability. So we need to know the number of outcomes in event A. So how many different ways can that happen divided by the number of possible outcomes. So when we look back at our previous probability model, we started calculating individual probabilities based on this exact idea. There was one possible way to run a, or roll a sum of two out of 36 total possible outcomes. Probability of rolling a two, one out of 36. There were two possibilities for rolling a three out of 36, so probability of rolling a three would be two out of 36 and so on. Okay. Now, one of the things that you may want to make sure you know, because with probabilities, most of the time it's going to be rolling dice or working with playing cards. If you are not familiar with a standard 52 card deck of playing cards, you need to become familiar with them. Okay? So, later on down the road, if you don't know what cards are in there, how many different suits, how many different uh, numbers in each suit, things like that, how many face cards, you need to kind of get a cheat sheet of some kind and get that figured out. Okay? So I have everything listed here. If you ever want to go back on the notes online and print off this page or this particular slide so you have that, it might be helpful if you don't understand what types of cards are in the deck and so on. But that's going to be something that's a huge thing with probabilities. All right. These two probability rules, or these three probability rules that we're going to discuss, are extremely important. You must know these. First, a probability must be a number between 0 and 1. Or in percent, must be between 0 and 100%. So one of the things you need to be able to do is work with probabilities in both percentage and decimal form. So 0.86 would result in an 86% chance to be able to convert back and forth. So probability must be a number between 0 and 1. Probability of exactly 0 means what? There's 0 chance it can happen. There is no way that something like that can happen. So if I roll a die, what's the probability that I roll a 7? 0. There is no 7 on a, on a standard die. Okay. If the probability is 1, that means what? It's a 100% chance. It will happen no matter what. So if I roll a standard die, what's the probability that I roll a number less than 7? 100%, because they're all less than 7. Okay? So it has to be somewhere in between. You cannot have a percentage larger than 100%. You cannot have one less than 0. Okay? Those are the absolutes. The second one comes with building your probability model, or part, part of building your probability model. When you look at the set of all outcomes, when you look at your sample space, the probability of said sample space has to equal 1. So if I were to calculate the probabilities for different outcomes within my sample space, and I add them all up, and they don't equal 1, that means I made a mistake somewhere. Either my probabilities are wrong, or I'm missing events, or I'm adding in or, or adding in extra events, something is going on that's not right. So the sample space, when you add up all of your possible probabilities, has to always equal 1. These two things together constitute what we call a legitimate probability distribution. 
This is something you will be expected to know. If they give you a probability model, so they say here are the different outcomes, here are the probabilities for each of those different outcomes. You need to determine if it's a legitimate probability model or not. So to do that, you need to figure out, well, are all the probabilities between 0 and 1? So if they are, they've satisfied condition 1. The next thing you need to check is, when you add up all of those individual probabilities, do they equal 1? If they do, you've satisfied both conditions, it's a legitimate probability model. If one or the other fails, it is not a legitimate probability model. So if something somewhere is wrong, you would need to investigate and find out why it's wrong. Okay. Now, the next rule is called the complement rule. That is something I would definitely write down. The complement of an event is the probability that that event does not occur. So it's like the exact opposite probability of what you'd be looking at. So think about if you have a 20% chance of being to class on time. So the probability of getting to class on time is 20%. What's the probability that you're not in class on time? 80%. How do you know? Okay, because you guys already kind of know this rule already, and you're using these ideas without even realizing it. You know that together, there's got to be a 100% chance of something happening, right? That's the probability that the sample space is equal to 1. We know that if we have a 20% chance of not being on time, or of being on time, then we have an 80% chance of not being on time. Okay, so the complement rule says that the probability of an event not occurring is simply 1 minus the probability that it does occur. So anytime you're looking for the probability that something does not happen, you need to look at the probability that it does and then subtract from 1. Okay. So, some quick examples here with probabilities. We're just going to go through one or two of these because you guys, I think, have a pretty good handle on basic probabilities. What would be the probability of choosing a male in this room? So if someone's going to come in and choose someone at random, what's the probability that they would actually select a male? So there are 17 students. How many are male? No, not me. Just uh, I was so selecting a student from the room. So six males out of seventeen total. So the probability would be six out of seventeen. Okay. So number of outcomes in event A being male divided by total outcomes seventeen total students. Make sense? <laughs> okay. Probability of rolling a four on a single die. One out of six. There's only one four on a single die. So one out of six. What's the probability of rolling at least a four on a single die? Yeah. So then you have to think about the options. I could roll a four, a five, or a six. So three different outcomes out of six. So three out of six, or if we reduce it down, one half. Probability of drawing a face card from a deck of cards. Now here's where knowledge of a deck of cards has to happen. <laughs> All right, so how many face cards are in a deck of cards? The ace is not a face card. So there are 12 face cards, jack, queen, king of each suit. So 12 face cards out of how many total? 52, which then you would reduce down and solve. Okay. When you report probabilities, one quick thing here. You can report your probabilities as a fraction, or you can re represent them as a decimal. I don't care which way you go as long as you have the correct answer. So fraction or decimal works. Yeah. All right. Homework. Yes, it's a worksheet. I forgot it's not a focus on.